Hello and welcome to our 22nd annual Jean S. Marks Memorial Education Forum. My name is Josh Marks and I'm the CEO for Medical Service Company. Like in years past, today's event offers sessions from highly regarded healthcare professionals spanning the globe. We are honored to provide a premier education in the sleep and respiratory disciplines for some of the most important healthcare heroes in our communities, you. We have an action-packed day for you with 10 speakers from distinguished universities, health systems, and supporting organizations. Before we get going, let me give you a quick lay of the land for today's program. This morning, we'll have four sessions for all of you to attend, the fourth being the keynote. Then, after a 30-minute break, there will be concurrent sessions running the remainder of the day, one for the sleep discipline and one for respiratory. Throughout each session, you can submit questions under the Engage tab just above the presentation screen. Speakers will address questions following their presentations as time allows. All sessions have been approved for continuing education credits by the AARC and all morning and sleep sessions approved by the BRPT. After a few minutes into each session, you will see a pop-up on your screen inviting you to evaluate the session and speaker. If you miss the pop-up or wish to fill out the evaluation later, simply click the blue button called Check-In Survey, located on the screen above the name of the presentation. At the end of the day, you'll be able to download your certificate from your account within the virtual event website. Before we kick things off, I'd like to thank our speakers, sponsors, and DME partners. Sponsors, thank you for your support of this event we would have a very difficult time offering this type of event without your support. We all have a choice of who we do business with. Please consider these manufacturers and suppliers. They clearly believe in the DME channel and investing in home care. DME partners, it's inspiring to see us band together for the benefit of our partners and our patients. Today, we are all one team. Because of the valuable information being shared by our world-renowned speakers, we will be better equipped to care for the millions of Americans with sleep and respiratory condition. One more thing. Before each session, you're going to hear a little bit more about MSC from a few of our team members. To learn more about anything you hear and how we can support you and your patients, visit medicalserviceco.com. Now, let the forum begin. Good morning and welcome to this year's forum. I'm excited to introduce the first speaker of the day. Our first lecture will be provided and presented by Dr. John Carter. Dr. Carter is a sleep neurologist, also known as a neurosomnologist. Dr. Carter practices in the Metro Health System in Cleveland, Ohio. He's been with Metro Health since 2017, following his residency and fellowships in neurology and sleep medicine at the University of Washington. Dr. Carter's specific focus and interest include sleep-related movement disorders, parasomnias, hypersomnia, and novel treatments for obstructive sleep apnea. Today, Dr. Carter will be presenting his lecture, Things That Go Bump in the Night, Parasomnias and Other Unusual Sleep Behaviors. After the presentation, Dr. Carter will be taking questions from you. Make sure to submit questions during the lecture by clicking the Engage tab above the presentation screen. Also, as a reminder, please be sure to complete and submit an evaluation following each presentation. We are so grateful for Dr. Carter's participation over the years and are happy to welcome him again as a speaker for this year. We hope you enjoy this lecture. So thanks so much for uh, having me today. Uh, my name is John Carter. I'm a neurosomnologist uh, at Metra Health. A neurosomnologist is someone who specializes in neurology and sleep medicine. And so a lot of my work is uh, helping to bridge the gap between what's happening in the brain and the nervous system uh, while we're asleep. Today, we're going to be talking about parasomnias or things that go bump in the night. Um, a parasomnia very simply is uh, an undesired or unusual behavior during sleep. Um, and uh, it is different from the other type of somnias, which people are probably familiar with. Insomnia is a condition where we can't sleep. Hypersomnia is where we sleep too much. And therefore, parasomnia is a condition where we're doing or feeling or sensing something undesired or unusual that happens when we're asleep or falling asleep or waking up from sleep. 
Many of you will be familiar with the different uh, stages of sleep. Uh, we divide sleep into non-REM sleep or NREM and REM sleep. REM, of course, stands for rapid eye movement sleep. And the types of parasomnias or the types of unusual behaviors that we can see at night can happen either in non-REM sleep or in REM sleep, typically not both. And what they look like depends a lot on the stage of sleep that they are happening in. The non-REM parasomnias, which include things like confusional arousals, sleep walking, sleep terrors, and sleep eating disorder, really are quite different from the REM parasomnias, things like nightmares, sleep paralysis, and REM behavior disorder. This is important because what we see either in the sleep lab or in the bedroom when these behaviors are happening can tell us a lot about what is going on in the brain, even if we don't have access to tools such as a sleep study. Of course, if we're seeing these behaviors happen in the sleep lab, then we have a lot more information about what the brain is doing at the moment. When I think about non-REM sleep versus REM sleep, I like to think about uh, a body of water. And uh, in non-REM sleep, you can think about a calm, placid uh, lake on a nice uh, summer day. There are slow, undulating waves. There's minimal current. And that's very similar, actually, to what we see on the EEG during non-REM sleep. There are big, slow, predictable movements in the brain activity. Contrast that with rapid eye movement or REM sleep, and this is more your turbulent uh, windswept waters. The brain activity is much more active. It's much faster. It actually looks much more like you're awake. Um, you're also getting very rapid movements of the eyes, which is where the name REM sleep uh, comes from. And so the types of parasomnias that we see in REM sleep tend to be a lot more active and outgoing, whereas the parasomnias that we see in REM sleep, uh, which tend to be uh, much slower associated with confusion, uh, things of that nature. Um, and therefore, when we graph out uh, what can happen over the course of a typical night, uh, we get something uh, like this. When we're transitioning from wakefulness into drowsiness and eventually into non-REM sleep, we have what's called the sleep-wake uh, transition uh, disorders. When we're in uh, non-REM sleep, of course, we have our non-REM uh, parasomnias. And then when we're in REM sleep, we have our REM parasomnias. As many of you will already know, as the brain goes through the sleep cycles over the course of the night, we get more and more REM sleep. We get more frequent and more prolonged periods of REM sleep. And therefore, when we see a parasomnia in the latter half of the night, the last few hours, it's more likely to be happening in REM simply because we have more REM sleep in the second part of the night compared to the first few hours of the night where we have more non-REM sleep and we're more likely to see non-REM parasomnias. Fundamentally, parasomnias represent an overlap between different brain states. Uh, and if we have a REM parasomnia, that represents an overlap between the brain in REM sleep and wakefulness. Similarly, if we have a non-REM parasomnia, that represents an overlap between uh, part of the brain being awake and part of the brain being in non-REM sleep. Very often, uh, I get questions from my patients and, and uh, sometimes from colleagues about, you know, if the brain is asleep, how on earth do we go through these very complicated behaviors? If you think about sleepwalking as an example, you have to sit up, get out of bed, remove the covers, navigate your way around the room, in some cases navigate out of the room, all while the brain is actually asleep. And the way this works is that only a very small part of the brain has been triggered, turned on, or, or made awake, whereas most of the, uh, the brain is actually asleep. And the control of sleep uh, essentially uh, all goes through this very small, final common uh, pathway, which is called the hypothalamus, uh, which is shown here uh, in red, a very small, dense cluster of nerve cells that sits at the base of the brain, uh, joining the brain and the brain stem. Uh, and this serves as a relay area, controlling uh, the brain's transition from being awake to being asleep, and also controlling our transition from non-REM sleep to REM sleep.
the reason that we can get such complicated behaviors, even though a very small part of the brain is awake or active at one time and most of the brain is asleep, has to do with something called central pattern generators, which are sometimes called CPGs. The idea here is that the brain is trying to be efficient. If your brain had to think through every movement that you made, let's say you're picking up an object on the desk, your brain would have to think about where is the object in space and then would have to move your arm close to it and then have to move your hand closer and then navigate your fingers around it and then lift it up. That's way too much computing power for the brain to do every single time. And so the brain uses shortcuts. These shortcuts are called central uh, pattern generators in, in most cases. The idea here is the brain can encode for a very complicated action using a very small shortcut, a very small group of nerve cells, that when that group of nerve cells is triggered, it then sets up a cascade where the other groups of nerve cells that execute those individual actions are triggered. And where these little clusters of nerve cells are located in the brain influences the types of behaviors that they code for. For example, high up in in the cerebral cortex, you have complicated so-called high-level behaviors, things like talking, understanding speech, moving our hands, fingers, and, and legs. A little bit lower down, you have more basic activities, things like eating and chewing and swallowing, moving our eyes and breathing. And way down in the spinal cord, you have clusters of nerve cells that are responsible for locomotor movements, uh, moving our legs and feet, even our trunk in a way that allows us to, uh, to move around and, and walk around. So what can happen during a, uh, let's say, a sleepwalking episode or any type of parasomnia is that a small area of the brain becomes activated, but that small area of the brain is responsible for very complicated behaviors. That part of the brain gets triggered for a number of reasons, which we'll talk about. And even though most of the brain is asleep, even though we're not conscious, we're not aware of what's going on, the brain and brain stem and spinal cord can execute uh, very complicated behaviors. I mentioned what the parasomnias look like uh, can tell us a lot about what's actually going on. Uh, and this graph uh, demonstrates that. So the simplest type of non-REM uh, parasomnia, which is called a confusional arousal, typically involves uh, just a small part of the brain, perhaps that controls speech uh, being activated, but the locomotor or the movement parts of the brain are not activated. By contrast, if we have a sleepwalking episode, the parts of the brain that are responsible for movement and locomotion are activated. And in a parasomnia called sleep terrors or night terrors, we actually have activation of the part of the brain called the amygdala, which is responsible for our fight or flight response. And if anybody's ever seen a sleep terror, you'll understand why that, uh, why that happens. So the part of the brain that primes us to fight or run away is being activated, and that can cause the classic symptoms that we see in a sleep terror, the uncontrollable screaming or crying and the unresponsiveness to, uh, to external stimulation. So let's talk through some of these um, uh, examples of parasomnias individually, and I'll show you some videos of what this might look like at home or in the sleep lab. The first and most common type of non-REM parasomnia is called a confusional arousal. And this involves a small part of the brain becoming active or awake. Um, typically, people, when they're experiencing a confusional arousal, will sit up in bed. They may say something. If uh, we're listening to them, it's usually a nonsensical uh, sort of a thing. They appear confused and disoriented and very often uh, fall back asleep. This is a close cousin of sleepwalking. Really, the only difference between a confusional arousal and sleepwalking is that in sleepwalking, a part of the brain that controls movement gets activated. And so we have the confusion, the puzzled behavior and disorientation, but we also have walking and, and moving around. So let's watch a video of a confusional uh, arousal. And then um, what I'd recommend is when you uh, pay attention to uh, the guy on the couch here, uh, watch uh, what happens when uh, he starts moving and when his uh, girlfriend here starts talking to him. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. The holes? What holes? How much more do we have left? Not too many. Okay. Ready to go to bed? 
Yeah. And now he's awake. Um, so what we saw in this brief video is a classic example of a confusional arousal type of non-REM parasomnia. So it started out with these kind of purposeless, uh, sort of twisty uh, movements uh, of his hands. Um, when his girlfriend uh, started talking to him, uh, he responded nonsensically. He asked something like, where is he? She asked who, he said the holes. She obviously didn't understand what that meant. Um, and then kind of continued prodding him until he finally sat up and, uh, and woke up. So that's an example of the kind of complex behaviors that the brain can initiate. They're strung together in a way that seems purposeful, but when you actually analyze the content, they don't make sense. Because unlike when we're awake, during a confusional arousal, the um, connected parts of the brain that uh, link our understanding of verbal processing to the speech that we're producing, they're not connected. You get production, but uh, without the, the sensible part of it. Um, confusional arousals are very common um, in young children under five years of age. They're essentially universal. Um, this has to do with the fact that young children have a lot of deep stage three, also known as N3 or slow wave sleep. Uh, the deeper the stage of sleep, the more likely it is that most of the brain can be asleep, even though a tiny fraction of the brain uh, gets turned on. If we're in a lighter stage of sleep and a part of the brain gets triggered, it's much more likely that the whole brain is going to wake up. So instead of a parasomnia, we get an awakening or an arousal. So because children have a lot of this very deep sleep, it's more likely that when they start to wake up, it's just part of the brain rather than the entire brain. As kids get older, confusion arousals become much less common, but they still can happen in adults. And somewhere between 1% and 4% of healthy adults will experience uh, confusional arousals with some regularity. Typically, these things are benign. However, if somebody is seeing me in the sleep clinic or the sleep lab and experiences a lot of confusional arousals, I'll want to look for things that might be triggering them, things that would trigger an arousal from sleep things like sleep apnea, things like uh, restless leg syndrome or periodic limb movements, uh, et cetera. But interestingly, if you look at people who experience confusional arousals regularly, half of them have some sort of anxiety, over half of them have depression, about a quarter of them have bipolar disorder, and about 13% of them have obstructive sleep apnea. So what this tells us is that there may be other processes going on in the brain that can contribute to a confusional arousal. Now, this does not mean that a confusional arousal causes anxiety or causes depression, but rather what it means is that if someone is experiencing depression or anxiety, there are changes in uh, the way that the brain is functioning, and that includes changes uh, in sleep. Um, very commonly, when someone is depressed, they will experience uh, changes in their sleep, sometimes sleeping too much, sometimes not sleeping enough or having insomnia, and those same neurologic processes that are resulting in the depression or the anxiety can uh, cause this disrupted sleep and therefore can contribute to arousals. So when I'm seeing patients with confusional arousals, unless they're a very young child, generally the thing to do is look for the triggers. Typically, you don't need to treat the confusional arousals on their own, but again, you want to look for what might be causing them. Avoid things like sleep deprivation, avoid big changes in the sleep schedule, so follow a regular sleep-wake uh, schedule. Similarly, you want to limit exposure to CNS depressants, things like alcohol, certain um, sedating medications, because again, anything that puts the brain in a deeper stage of sleep means that it's going to be more difficult. It's going to take more stimulation to wake the brain up fully and much more likely to get a partial arousal and therefore cause a parasomnia. Now, a close cousin of a confusional arousal is sleepwalking. Uh, the medical term for sleepwalking is somnambulism. Uh, and this, of course, is an arousal followed by the confusion and disorientation that we see in a confusional arousal, but then displacement from the bed. Sleepwalking may be very simple, moving around, shuffling around the room, but can um, include much more complex, sometimes even violent or agitated behavior. And sometimes these things make the news. Um, sleep-related uh, homicides, uh, sleep driving, uh, et cetera. Um, there is a specific type of sleepwalking episode known as sleep-relating 
sleep-related eating disorder or shred, which we'll talk about specifically. But the point is, uh, any number of very complicated behaviors can happen during a sleepwalking episode, depending on which part of the brain is being activated. Sleepwalking is very common in kids. Uh, up to about 15 or 20% of kids will experience sleepwalking at one point or another. And typically, these are kids between four and eight years of age. Um, persistent or common sleepwalking is unusual in adults. Again, it's somewhere between one and 4%. But if we look at the lifetime prevalence of sleepwalking um, in adults, it's about 30%. Typically, sleepwalking episodes are short, a few minutes at most, although uh, uh, up to 15 or 20 minutes have been reported um, in the past. So let's watch a couple of videos uh, of patients uh, in the sleep lab who have sleepwalking. This is a middle-aged uh, man who has a history of sleepwalking. And actually, during this particular event, he said he felt like uh, a truck was swooping down on him, as what he said to the sleep tech. Uh, and by his EEG, this happened in N3, or slow-wave sleep. So he's still asleep at this point, confused, looking around, mumbling. Now he's awake. and back to sleep. So that was a little bit of a dramatic example of what can happen, uh, but that is technically a type of sleepwalking. Typically, the slower shuffling, kind of wandering type of sleepwalking is more common, but these more rapid kind of emotional uh, type of behaviors can happen as well. So let's look at another example. This is a young woman who has a history of recurrent sleepwalking. Um, during this episode, uh, she reported to the sleep tech vague, sort of nonspecific dream material. And again, her EEG showed that she was in N3 or slow wave sleep. So she's speaking French here, but uh, she's kind of uh, mumbling, looking around, confused. And then in a minute here, the tech is going to come in. Lights are on. Now she's awake. Okay. So technically speaking, because she did not get out of the bed, this episode here would be called a confusional arousal. But this is a patient who, on other events, has had frequent sleepwalking. Uh, and so the two obviously can coexist. The brain processes that are causing a confusional arousal are essentially the same processes that are causing uh, sleepwalking. The major difference is, do you get out of bed or not? Now, most episodes of sleepwalking don't require specific treatment, but environmental safety really is the, the most important thing. So in uh, folks who have frequent sleepwalking, again, usually this is in children, um, you want to make sure that the environment is safe. Cover up um, hard edges in the bedroom. Uh, make sure that you have hard to access locks on the interior doors, uh, child gates at the top of um, staircases. Uh, make sure dangerous things like guns and knives are locked up securely, uh, remove knobs from the stove if someone has a, a type of sleepwalking where they go into the kitchen or operate the stove, which I have seen before, um, consider things like bed or door alarms. Um, now, you don't need these things for rare or occasional sleepwalking, but for frequent uh, or recurrent sleepwalking, these are some recommendations that we will give to folks just to make sure that their bedroom environment and home environment is as safe as possible. Scheduled awakenings can be 
helpful. So typically uh, 15 to 30 minutes before the usual onset of an episode, if it's predictable, uh, you can have somebody set an alarm or have a parent or bed partner uh, wake them up. And that generally uh, kind of breaks the cycle. It gets them out of that very deep phase of sleep and makes it less likely to have sleepwalking or confusional arousal. There's some evidence for psychotherapy or hypnosis. I personally have not, never prescribed either of those things for sleepwalking per se. Um, as before, you want to avoid things that can precipitate or exacerbate sleepwalking, things like sedating, uh, certain types of sedating medications, particularly certain types of sleeping pills. Ambien is one of the more common medications that can cause or exacerbate sleepwalking or confusional arousals. And in some cases, uh, very, very rarely, uh, you may wish to uh, prescribe a medication to treat the sleepwalking. The few occasions in which uh, I have prescribed medications to treat sleepwalking all have to do with cases where someone has injured themselves or someone else. Um, I uh, have one uh, young patient who uh, has a feeding tube called the GJ tube and uh, has confusional arousals and also sleepwalking. But when he had a confusional arousal, would always pull his GJ tube out, which meant a trip to the emergency room uh, every time to get it replaced. Uh, that's an example of uh, when I would use a medication to reduce the frequency of, um, of the confusional arousal. The medications listed here, benzodiazepines such as uh, clonopin, halcyon, uh, diet stat, et cetera, can be used, as well as other medications, certain antidepressants, uh, and so on. Sleep terrors uh, are a more dramatic form of non-REM parasomnia. Again, these tend to happen when the amygdala or the fight or flight center of the brain is activated. Um, these are much more common in kids uh, than in adults, uh, and uh, they're hard to forget when you see them. Um, you know, uh, blood curdling, uh, scream, really fast heart rate, fast uh, breathing, uh, very fearful uh, response. Um, oftentimes, uh, attempts to, uh, you know, get somebody out of the sleep terror actually ends up uh, agitating them more and, uh, and makes things worse. Um, these are very, very rare in adults, but more common in kids. Uh, somewhere between 1% and 6% of kids will experience these. In my experience, it's a little more, probably more like 10%. Um, the good news is these are uh, typically entirely benign. Um, they're much scarier for us as parents and caregivers uh, than they are for kids. And because they tend to happen in stable, non-REM, stage 3 sleep or slow-wave sleep, they're typically not something that you're going to remember. Uh, so um, typically the thing to do is calm, quiet reassurance. Don't try and interrupt the sleep terror uh, episode. Don't try and snap them out of it. Again, ensure good environmental safety. You can also consider scheduled awakenings for night terrors if they happen on a regular schedule. And in very, very, very rare cases, uh, medications like benzodiazepines uh, can be used. Uh, again, I will almost never prescribe these medicines for a night terror, but on very rare occasions when they're severe and frequent, it's something to consider uh, on a short-term basis. Very often I get asked, what's the difference between a sleep terror and a nightmare? The basic difference is a sleep terror is happening in non-REM sleep, whereas a nightmare is happening in REM sleep. Uh, as we talked about, because we have more non-REM sleep in the first part of the night, sleep terrors tend to happen more in the first part of the night, whereas we have more REM sleep in the latter part of the night, therefore we have more nightmares in the latter part of the night. Some of the other items you see in the table here can help us differentiate between nightmares uh, and night terrors. Night Nightmares are uh, much more common, of course, and typically are associated with dream materials. You wake somebody up after a nightmare, and they're usually able to tell you with some degree of detail what they were thinking about or dreaming about. With a sleep terror, typically there's no memory of the episode. Now, there's a special type of non-REM uh, parasomnia known as sleep-related uh, eating disorder, uh, which is a type of sleepwalking or somnambulism during which someone prepares and consumes uh, edible and non-edible substances while they're asleep. Now, the operative word here is while they're asleep, because there are other types of eating disorders that happen in and around sleep at night, but sleep-related eating disorder is a parasomnia, meaning it happens while we're asleep, whereas these other conditions happen 
at night while we're awake. So these other conditions are known as night eating syndrome and evening hyperphagia. You can see the definitions here. Evening hyperphagia means uh, eating a lot uh, uh, after the last meal and before falling asleep while fully awake. And night eating uh, syndrome is a related condition where we consume over half of our daily calories in the late evening or during overnight awakening. So most commonly, this is someone who wakes up in the middle of the night, goes into the kitchen, has a big meal, and goes back to sleep, but they're awake and aware of doing it. People with sleep-related uh, eating disorder are asleep. They're not aware of what's going on. Um, overall, this is rare. Fewer than 5% of people in the general population experience sleep-related eating disorder. But in patients with other types of eating disorders, particularly people who are seeking treatment for obesity, it tends to be much more common as much as 15 or 16% uh, of folks in that population are going to experience sleep-related uh, eating disorder. So I can give you an example. At Metro Health, we have a very active bariatric surgery or weight loss surgery program. And a fair number of the patients that I see in that program uh, end up uh, having sleep-related uh, eating disorders. Um, very often, these are high-calorie foods that are consumed. You know, we're we're really not going into the fridge and you know eating a stick of celery. It's uh, you know a, a carton of ice cream, a half of a pizza. Sometimes non-edible things are are uh, consumed as well. So I had one patient who uh, would smear peanut butter on a carton of cigarettes. Uh, and uh, eat that. Uh, I should say, uh, try to eat it. She would wake up after she took the first bite and then realize what it was. Um, but uh, this can often really stymie efforts to uh, lose weight because, again, taking the example of bariatric uh, surgery, these are people who are putting in a lot of effort to control uh, their diet to eat healthy uh, during the day. And while they're asleep, their body is essentially sabotaging them uh, and consuming all of these calories. So this is an important thing to look out for, particularly if uh, someone is trying to lose weight and, and can't. On a sleep study, we see a classic pattern, which is called RMMA, rhythmic masticatory motor or muscle activity, which we'll take a look at. Um, the treatment uh, for this typically involves locking up the food, removing knobs from the stove, putting a lock on the refrigerator. Again, you can still do some pretty complicated things when you're asleep, but if you add some additional levels or barriers in place, it can make it less likely that, uh, that you'll actually successfully get to the food. As with all the other parasomnias, you want to treat any other existing sleep disorders, things that might trigger the sleep-related eating, things like sleep apnea, restless leg syndrome, uh, et cetera. And in this case, there are some medications that have good evidence behind them. Uh, I will often prescribe topiramate or Topamax uh, to reduce uh, sleep-related uh, eating problems in, in people who experience this frequently. This is an example of RMMA. Um, in the sleep lab on video, if you saw somebody eating, you wouldn't necessarily know that they were asleep while they were doing it unless, of course, you had an EEG. And that's exactly what we're seeing. So out of N2 sleep, suddenly we have uh, this very rhythmic muscle um, activity. If you have a masseter EMG, that's where most of the activity uh, is. But this is essentially rhythmic uh, chewing movement uh, that, uh, that comes out of sleep. Okay, a few more unusual non-REM parasomnias, and then we'll move on to conclude with the REM parasomnias. So one uh, particularly fascinating condition is known as exploding head uh, syndrome. So people with this particular condition will explain that they wake up suddenly feeling like they've heard a loud sound, a crash or a crack or a boom or an explosion that feels like it's happening in their head. Uh, this wakes them up. They often feel very frightened as a result. But interestingly, uh, it's not associated with pain. So this is not a headache disorder. You know, as a neurologist, I see a lot of uh, uh, folks who have headaches of one sort or another that can happen uh, during sleep. These are called hypnic headaches, but this is not one of them. Uh, you wake up feeling like something went off in your head, but you don't have any pain uh, associated with it. We think that this might be a type of what's called hypnic hallucinations, which is that the brain is generating uh, a sound or the part of the brain that controls our perception of sound is getting triggered. So this is a type of parasomnia um, that then wakes us up. 
This is supposedly rare if you read the literature, but I think it's actually much more common. Uh, once people uh, are aware of what's going on, they're much more likely to report that they uh, experience this. Typically, there's really not much that needs to be done from a treatment standpoint, aside from reassurance, educating people about what's going on. But in the case uh, when this might happen very frequently, there are a number of medications which you can see listed here that uh, do have some evidence uh, behind them. Okay, so let's switch gears and talk about parasomnias that happen in REM sleep. So remember, we've been talking about non-REM parasomnias, which are the kind of calm, placid waters of sleep. Now we're moving on to the more active, windswept uh, waters, which are uh, REM sleep. So REM behavior disorder is among the most dramatic, not the most common, but the most dramatic example of a REM parasomnia. Um, in REM behavior disorder, we essentially have enactment of our dreams. So the reason that this doesn't happen to all of us all the time is that there are switches in the brain that cause muscle paralysis. So we call that REM atonia. So totally normally when the brain moves into REM sleep, there's another part of the brain that essentially turns off parts of the spinal cord uh, that control our muscle movement. Um, that's normal. So if you're monitoring muscle tone on a sleep study, typically on the chin, you'll see that muscle tone drop down to just about nothing in REM sleep. If that doesn't happen, you can have dream enactment behavior and REM behavior disorder is one example of that. So let's watch a video. Okay, so a lot going on there. Um, it started out kind of nondescript. It sort of looked like the first few videos that we saw, a few kind of small movements of the hands. And then you saw his legs and, and feet start to move almost as if he was trying to run uh, towards something, away from something, I don't know. And then finally he sits up, leans over and starts trying to smack something or punch something uh, on the bed. And that's very common uh, dream enactment behavior that we see in REM behavior uh, disorder. So most commonly, these are self-defense movements. People will typically say during a uh, REM behavior disorder episode, they're dreaming of being chased or pursued or having to fend off uh, an attacker. And the types of movements that we see with REM behavior disorder go along with that. They're trying to swat something off or hit something or punch something or defend ourselves. And there have been cases of injury both to the patient as well as to the bed partner as a result of uh, dream enactment. And we'll watch a video about that in, in just a moment. Um, REM behavior disorder uh, is rare. Overall, about 1% of adults uh, have this condition. As we get older, it gets more common. Um, it uh, is more common in men uh, compared to women for reasons that aren't very well uh, understood. Because it happens in REM sleep and we have more REM sleep in the latter half of the night, we tend to see the REM enact, uh, the dream enactment behaviors uh, more commonly in the second half uh, of the night. And again, you can get all kinds of different behaviors, but most commonly it's the self-defense uh, type of behavior. So let's watch another example here. A little simpler and shorter than the last one, right? So a couple of movements of the legs and a quick swat uh, of his hand. Uh, and uh, this is certainly the kind of movement that could result in injury, right? I mean, he swatted the uh, the edge of his, uh, his nightstand there with some pretty good force. You could imagine if it was the other hand or if he was sleeping in the other direction, uh, he certainly could have, uh, you know, smacked his bed partner. Um, and we do see cases occasionally of um, injuries to bed partners, you know, bruises, uh, you know, awakening them out of sleep, that sort of thing, as a result of uh, REM behavior disorder. Watch another example. <laughs> <laughs> 
Acre. So in that example, we saw more like running uh, uh, sorts of movements, which again can be seen in, uh, in REM behavior disorder. These typically are a lot more forceful, violent, if you will, than the type of um, ambulation or locomotion that you might see in somnambulism or sleepwalking, which again is a non-REM parasomnia. Now, there is an interesting association between REM behavior disorder or RBD and other neurologic disorders. So when we're thinking about REM behavior disorder, we divide it into primary and secondary RBD, sometimes called idiopathic uh, or primary RBD. The idea here is that REM behavior disorder usually is caused by something else. So we would call this secondary REM behavior disorder. It may be from medications. It may be from other sleep disorders such as sleep apnea. And in that case, uh, you get rid of the offending medication or you treat the sleep apnea and the REM behavior disorder goes away. So the final common pathway there is the medicine or the sleep apnea is causing the muscle tone in REM sleep to be unusually high. So that normal REM atonia that paralyzes the muscles is no longer able to happen, so we act out our dreams. That's less of a concern. Again, you treat the underlying problem, the REM behavior disorder gets better. But primary REM behavior disorder, which is sometimes called idiopathic RBD, is very strongly associated with other neurologic disorders, particularly neurodegenerative disorders. Um, and there's a certain group of neurodegenerative disorders that we call alpha synucleinopathies. These are things like Parkinson's disease or Lewy body dementia. And people with these uh, neurodegenerative disorders are very likely to have REM behavior disorder. So over half uh, of people with idiopathic or primary RBD eventually go on to develop a neurodegenerative disorder, but this is very often years and years later. So sometimes in the sleep clinic or the sleep lab, we're seeing someone with REM behavior disorder and we have the job of discussing with them, you know, look, we're not able to determine another cause of this. You don't have sleep apnea. You're not on any medications that might cause this. We really need to be cautious over the next few years um, to monitor for the development of another neurologic problem, whether it's Parkinson's or uh, dementia or uh, some other type of issue. Um, so that's a really important uh, role that we in the sleep lab and the sleep clinic uh, have to play. That being said, REM behavior disorder is usually secondary to something like medication or another problem. Um, this is a little snippet from a uh, polysomnogram. Uh, what you can see here is that there, this patient is in REM sleep, as evidenced by the rapid eye movements. Um, but if you look at the EMG on their chin and the EMG on their legs, there is abnormally high muscle tone, whereas this should be a pencil-thin line. You can see it's kind of a thick caterpillar-looking uh, line, uh, which is a sign that the muscle tone is abnormally high. As far as parasomnias go, uh, REM behavior disorder is the one parasomnia where you actually need a sleep study to make the diagnosis. Okay, so this slide here shows you an example of secondary REM behavior disorder, that is REM behavior disorder that's caused by something else. So in the first panel here on the top, you can see this is a patient in REM sleep. Uh, you can see their chin EMG there in that kind of reddish brown color is, is really thick. It's not that thin. Uh, pencil line. So this is abnormally high tonic muscle tone in REM. And then if we look down at the uh, respiratory tracing there, you can see that this is uh, somebody who's having sleep apnea events. They're having obstructive uh, hypopneas that are causing them to, uh, to arouse from sleep. Um, and then in the same patient, you put them on CPAP, which is what we see at the lower uh, half of the uh, screen here. Their breathing improves, and then their chin tone drops down to this pencil thin line, which is what it should be. So in this case, I'm not worried about this person developing a neurodegenerative disorder. This is sleep apnea that's essentially causing a false positive for REM behavior disorder. So very important when we're evaluating patients with this complaint that we have not only a full history, but also a good uh, sleep study as well. Uh, 
Very often, uh, REM behavior disorder uh, that's idiopathic or primary will require treatment, and we frequently prescribe either high-dose melatonin or clonazepam, which is a benzodiazepine. Now, you can um, uh, you know, start at low doses, the kind of three, five, six milligrams that you might use for insomnia with melatonin, but very frequently, patients will require very high doses, 15 milligrams, 20 milligrams, 30 milligrams, way higher than you would use uh, for your garden variety uh, insomnia. Uh, the mechanism of this is not terribly well uh, understood, aside from the fact that these high doses of melatonin seem to augment the uh, REM muscle atonia. Um, the uh, benzodiazepine, such as clonazepam or clonopin, uh, reduces the tonic EMG uh, muscle activity. Um, of course, with benzodiazepines, we have to worry about respiratory suppression, worsening things like obstructive sleep apnea, and obviously this uh, has to be used very carefully. Um, so uh, we're uh, in the home stretch here. Um, so we've been talking about abnormally high muscle tone in REM, but you can have the opposite problem. So you can have the low muscle tone, the atonia or the paralysis in REM persist when the brain wakes up from REM sleep. And that's something called sleep paralysis. Um, sleep paralysis uh, occurs when the switch in the brain that controls REM sleep turns off, so we wake up, but the switch that controls paralysis is stuck on for a few seconds uh, to a minute. Our eyes can still move, our diaphragm can still move, but our skeletal muscles, our arm, uh, our chest muscles, our legs, our face, etc., our ability to speak, uh, the, that is still paralyzed. Very often, we still have some lingering dream activity, so it's common to have what's called sleep hallucinations along with uh, sleep paralysis. Um, we believe that sleep paralysis is probably the source material for a lot of uh, myths and legends, including the, uh, the painting that's shown here. So it's very common to experience these frightful uh, images, as well as uh, the obvious fear and anxiety that comes along from not being able to move or, or talk. Um, and uh, that being said, sleep paralysis uh, is usually benign. So many people will experience sleep paralysis at one point or another, particularly if we are sleep deprived or have something else, again, like sleep apnea that's disrupting our sleep. If sleep apnea, excuse me, if sleep paralysis is frequent or recurrent, um, there are a couple of things uh, to think about. One is narcolepsy. Uh, narcolepsy is a hypersomnia disorder, something that uh, we're not going to discuss in detail today, but part of the symptoms uh, that people with narcolepsy have is sleep paralysis. But it is possible to have recurrent isolated sleep paralysis, meaning you don't have apnea, you don't have narcolepsy, you don't have restless legs. You're not taking any medications that might cause the uh, sleep paralysis, but you're still getting it. There is some family link uh, to that. There may be a genetic uh, factor to why some people get recurrent uh, sleep paralysis, uh, but that's a relatively rare uh, condition. So up to 40% of people experience sleep paralysis at least once, but recurrent sleep paralysis is quite rare, fewer than uh, 2 to 3% of people. There are some treatments, uh, uh, medication treatments that, uh, that can help with recurrent isolated sleep paralysis. These are antidepressant medications, and these reduce the amount of REM sleep. They're called REM suppressants. By reducing REM, they can uh, reduce sleep paralysis as well. Okay, uh, last but not least, uh, nightmares, the most common uh, uh, issue or complaint that happens out of REM sleep. Now, just about everybody at one point is, uh, is going to experience uh, a nightmare. These are typically detailed uh, and vivid, associated with fear, anxiety, and other kind of negative emotions. 75% uh, of children uh, have experienced a nightmare uh, at least once. It may be higher than that. The peak uh, age for nightmares is 6 to 10 years of age, but any kind of triggering factor, stress, anxiety, uh, etc., can, uh, can cause nightmares well into adulthood. There is an entity known as nightmare disorder. So it's very common and normal to have nightmares. But if nightmares are frequent, recurrent, and begin to cause problems sleeping or daytime functional problems, this is called nightmare disorder. Sometimes this happens as a part of post-traumatic stress disorder or other types of trauma. 
Um, but it can also be caused as a side effect of medications, including certain antidepressants, certain sleep aids, beta blockers, which are sometimes given for high blood pressure or heart rhythm issues, uh, as well as certain types of antibiotics, antiviral medications, and Chantix, which is a medication um, that can uh, help people stop smoking. Um, you know, if you happen to capture a nightmare during a sleep study, of course, uh, these happen during uh, REM sleep. They're associated with a sudden arousal out of REM sleep and usually an increase in autonomic tone, increased heart rate, respiratory rate, that sort of a thing. Most of the time, nightmares do not need to be treated, but in the case of nightmare disorder, there are medications and other types of therapies that can be helpful. Things like prazosin, uh, which is an uh, alpha-2 uh, agonist, can be useful, especially for people who have a history of trauma associated with their nightmares. Um, image rehearsal therapy is a very effective treatment for recurrent nightmares and nightmare disorder. This is a form of um, exposure therapy, so we talk people through the content uh, of their recurrent nightmares, and we have them essentially re-script it, change the uh, events of the nightmare from a negative to a positive, rehearse that positive uh, image and experience, and then over time, the dream material itself is more likely to take on a, a positive tone. There's also some evidence for things like uh, hypnosis and other forms of psychotherapy in treating uh, recurrent nightmares. Okay, so that's been a whirlwind tour through things that go bump in the night, uh, parasomnias that happen uh, in non-REM and REM sleep. Thank you all for your uh, attention. I hope everybody stayed awake, and I'd be happy to answer some questions. Hello, Dr. Carter. Uh, thank you so much for helping us kick off our JSM CEU event this year. Um, as always, we appreciate your time and uh, the expertise that you bring to the table to share with the participants uh, to help them take better care of their patients. So um, looking forward, we've got some great questions from the audience and I uh, want to run through a few of them for you, give a chance for you to speak directly to them. And uh, thanks again for your time. Thanks for having uh, me. So the first question that came out from the audience, have you seen any research on medical marijuana and parasomnias? That is a great question. Uh, so this is an active area of research. Um, the entire scientific community really is, uh, is looking at the effects of uh, cannabis on human health from multiple different angles. Uh, sleep is prime territory for this. Um, the answer is it's complicated. Uh, you know, cannabis being a product of nature, uh, it's very difficult to study in the lab uh, because the amounts of different um, chemicals in the plant will vary from one plant to the next. And so the question is, are you talking about cannabis that's primarily THC, primarily CBD, et cetera, et cetera. Having said that, uh, the, uh, the, the short answer is it depends a little bit. So um, we know that uh, certain preparations of um, CBD in particular and, and THC to a lesser extent can have um, effects on sleep that we would consider positive. It can increase the amount of deep sleep uh, in a given night. It may uh, reduce uh, certain types of um, breathing irregularities actually in some cases. Um, on the flip side of that coin, um, heavy usage of, of cannabis uh, can lead to sleep disruption, including increased parasomnias. Withdrawal from heavy cannabis use can lead to similar forms of sleep disruption. So the answer really is it's complicated and, and it depends, uh, but um, the research is certainly ongoing. And, and I think as that continues in the next five or 10 years, we're going to have a much better answer to that question. Thanks, Dr. Carter. Yeah, a little new territory uh, with the the spreading uh, utilization of that for different practices. So um, I appreciate your response and sounds like more to come in the future as you stay engaged with this topic. That's right. Uh, the next question uh, centered around uh, working third shift and, and the impacts of that. So do you see that patients who have worked third shift, um, is there an impact to that on evening hyperphagia? So it, it, have you noticed a correlation there? That's a great question. So, so in general, I, I can't say that there's a strong correlation many years down the road. 
there certainly is a correlation in the short term. And what I mean by that is for those of us who are working, uh, let's say, second or third shift and are shifting back to a first shift schedule, either temporarily or intermittently, uh, you know, those of us who might work a few evening shifts and then work a few day shifts and then shift back, that certainly can sort of wreak havoc on our circadian rhythm and everything that comes along with that, including disrupting our appetite, causing changes in hormone production, affecting our metabolism. Uh, etc. Um, what's a little bit less clear is what happens 5, 10, 15 years down the road. You know, I started out as a night shift worker, let's say, but I've been on days for, for a decade. Uh, is that going to cause some lasting disruption in the, in the circadian rhythm? Um, the answer in general is uh, it, it shouldn't, um, but certainly we, we do see cases where folks have a lot of trouble adapting uh, to a, a change in their schedule. And there are actually things that we can do uh, medically as well as habitually to help kind of reach, uh, reset, uh, re-anchor the circadian rhythm. Perfect. Thanks, Dr. Carter. Appreciate that. I'm sure there's a lot of individuals, especially in the healthcare field, who uh, have uh, had that situation and uh, definitely helpful to understand those impacts. Uh, our next question um, centered around anxiety and depression. Are there any theories as to why individuals that have anxiety or depression are more likely to have parasomnias? And then they go on to ask, uh, do individuals with anxiety and depression typically have more in three sleep increasing the chances of it happening? That's a, that's a great question. And here again, the answer is, uh, it, it is complicated. Um, so there's a chicken or egg question when it comes to anxiety, depression, and sleep. Uh, it's entirely reasonable to think that um, if something is off with our sleep, that can affect our mood and our brain function and may actually cause anxiety and depression. And I think that's certainly true. But it's also true that even if we don't have sleep problems to begin with, if we become depressed or if we become anxious, that can actually cause problems with our sleep. And in that case, it probably boils down to some fundamental shared mechanism within the brain that's affecting both uh, our mood and that level of functioning as well as our, uh, our sleep. So there are multiple different axes uh, uh, where things can, can go awry. Uh, sleep. Most commonly, actually, it is uh, that people who are uh, in the bout of depression um, have more REM sleep. And actually, it's been observed in the short term that sleep deprivation and cutting down on uh, REM sleep, whether it's through medications, antidepressants, what have you, can actually be a temporary uh, fix for depression. Um, Probably the reason that people who are experiencing anxiety or depression, why they have more parasomnias, probably has to do with the sleep disruption aspect. So there are more what's called micro arousals uh, during sleep, and those are more likely to, to cause the parasomnias. Thanks, Dr. Carter. It looks like we've got time for one more question um, to make sure that uh, uh, we can let you get back to taking care of your patients as well as the audience members progressing through the, the JSM event. Um, so this one, uh, do you feel it is best to not interact with a person in the middle of a uh, REM sleepwalking episode? I know you talked about what to do, what not to do, and I'm sure there's a lot of us as either bed partners or parents of children who have experiences just making sure that we know what's what's the best way to handle that. Absolutely. Uh, again, I think this is a really great question. And, and the number one rule here is safety first. So when it comes to sleepwalking or a REM parasomnia like REM behavior disorder, uh, anything that you can do to ensure your own safety and, and the safety of the person who's experiencing the episode is, is what we should do. So to give you an example, um, if somebody is sleepwalking, if a child, let's say, is sleepwalking, we will often counsel the families. You know, it's okay to kind of gently re redirect them back to their back to their bedroom uh, you know I really wouldn't advise letting them wander the house um, unsupervised uh, and uh, you know similarly um, if somebody is acting out a dream uh, it, it is okay to you know apply a little bit of um, you know kind of uh, a gentle attention to to try and get them out of it the one exception to this uh, is the uh, the sleep terrors or night terrors um, 
which again are m- much, much, much more common in younger kids than they are in any other age group. These, uh, the evidence shows that our efforts to interrupt them really don't do us any good. Um, calm reassurance, totally appropriate. Trying to shake the kid awake, probably not appropriate. Uh, but as a general rule of thumb for these parasomnias, uh, as long as you're ensuring the safety of yourself, your bed partner, etc., cetera, uh, that's the right thing to do. Thank you so much, Dr. Carter. It sounds like there's so much amazing research going on still with this and uh, uh, look forward to continuing to hear more as I know you're very invested in uh, continuing to advance this research and sharing with us um, those updates. So thank you again for your time. It was great having you. Um, Appreciate your support of this event. Um, For uh, the audience members, uh, you will be shifting over to the second session. I'm sure on behalf of all of us, Dr. Carter, want to say thank you, appreciate your time, and uh, hope you have a great rest of your day. It's my pleasure. Thanks for having me.